Hello everyone, this is CJ Novo992 and today we're back for another brand new video, well, kinda new video as today's video is basically an audio experience ladies and gentlemen, that's right, I have finally threw the lucky cap of destiny in to the old podcast ring and I've joined with a couple of guys by the name of Stevie from 4 Lads Had A Dream and David Edgar from Heart and hand. We have came together to do a monthly report, which will be once every 30 days. Again, I'm not going to be annoying you doing audio podcasts all the time, but once every 30 days, we're going to come back, look at the last month and break down everything that's happened. So yeah, that's what you're going to be seeing today. I thought I'd just jump in here and explain what you're about to see, because from now, it's going to be David actually hosting this month's episode. I'll be hosting the next one, and I hopefully you do enjoy the audio-only podcast. If you do enjoy it, make sure you get involved down there in the comments section below. Share your opinions on all the topics we're here to break down and discuss. And hell, if you do enjoy it, make sure you be hitting that like button and subscribing as well. Now, I'll see you in about 50 minutes. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Rangers Report. That's when three of the, if we can be modest, leading lights of Rangers fan media get together to discuss all the things that have been happening with our great club over the last month or so. It will be a monthly show. And if you don't like my voice, my name's David Edgar, I'm the host of Heart and Hand, then don't worry because we'll be taking it in turns to host. And I'm joined, of course, by two magnificent specimens of Rangers humanity. First up, from the wonderful Four Lads Had a Dream blog, it's Stephen Clifford. Hiya, Stevie. Hi, mate. How are you? Feels big, this, doesn't it? This is a wee bit like Yalta. This is a wee bit like at the end of the war when, when Stalin and Churchill and Roosevelt got together. <laughs> I'm excited I, about it. I must have... The status I'm, I'm applying to this. And uh, raising... The uh, a level of hair on the show, but uh, certainly bringing down the average age is uh, the handsome star of his own YouTube channel, the wonderful CJ Novo. CJ, good afternoon, sir. How are you? Good afternoon, mate. I'm I'm enjoying this. this is my first ever uh, audio only podcast, so I'm quite looking forward to being able to uh, just sit here, bald naked, and talk about Rangers. Love it. Me and, me and Stevie admitted where that video was not going to be an option for either of us to. Um, you can yeah, you you can go away with that. Stipulated. Yes, do get away with that young man, but for me and him, I'm afraid, no, we do not wish to scare the listeners as uh, <laughs> we join us in this show. But yeah, um, the, one of the reasons, folks, we decided to do this is that uh, at times, I think, it, there's almost a, I don't know whether it's human nature, I don't know whether it's 2020, that, that people seem to think that because the three of us all have our own thing, that we must have a terrible rivalry, and in fact, it's not true at all it's always been very helpful to each other um and quite enjoyed discussing rangers with each other you know because we're fans so we thought we'd just get together once a month um no real rules or lists in place but this is a good bit of timing really because after the longest transfer window that i can ever remember um it's finally shut so we can start off i think by for the first time really this season being able to talk about our summer's business um, Stevie, I'll start with you. Very simple question, my friend. How how happy or otherwise are you with now what Rangers have, have done by the time the window slammed shut? I think very happy. I think if we hadn't have added um, Bongani Zungu, I would have been concerned about the, the midfield. Um, but since he came in, um, and obviously he has a bit of an unknown quantity, David. I'm not going to sit and pretend I know an awful lot about him. Um, so... At the moment, I would say the transfer window is an 8, with a possibility of being a 10 and a possibility of being a 6, just depending on how it goes. But um, obviously the big deals, Hadji was the main one, um, and then Roof and Ippen arriving as well. And I think the other business we've done has been smart. See, it's felt funny because, I mean, as Stevie said there, the Hadji deal was part of this, and it seems like it was forever ago. Um, a lifetime back, ago, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Back, in, back in May that it was announced. And then, of course, the last day of the window, we got Bongani Zungu. What were the key positions that you felt going into this season needed looked at? And the players that have come in, how do you think that the ones we've seen so far are doing? Uh, well, I think one of the key positions we needed to strengthen was we needed to add more goals to the team. And I felt like uh, we are on Morales and Jermaine Defoe, you're always going to get goals, but we needed different types of players for different scenarios to break down different teams because we saw that a couple of times last season when plan A or plan B was not one with the other plan C. So I think getting Roof's very clever. I think Big Cedric's going to come good because he's a bit of a physical threat. Um, but even another deal that I was actually really impressed with is even promoting Young Patterson up for the Youth Academy up to the first team. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be a very smart move for Rangers moving forward. 
I'm a great believer in something Gary Neville said, where he said, if your youth system can't at least provide you with a, a reserve fullback, <laughs> then why bother having it? No, and he, he's right, because exactly if you don't spot. feel confident enough that it can bring you in a player that will do that position, then why are you bothering? And, and I really do like the look of Parson, uh, and I like the look of young Bassey on the other wing. He's oh, yeah. raw as all hell. I mean, yeah. he is. But mm-hmm. big, powerful lad, and, and he will improve. One of the things that uh, I, I think, Stevie, that was referred to there by CJ was we needed strikers. And there was, of course, this summer, we've got to talk about it, we, we can't not. Um, and that is, of course, Alfredo Morelos is... Uh, on off, will it happen, won't it happen move to Lille, now we know from the Lille uh, owner so I think that's a legit source uh, <laughs> that, that they bid 16 million euros for Alfredo, it was turned down now, two schools of thought on that as far as I can see on the one hand, you're going oh, 16 million is a lot of money, I hope they got that right the other is well, you know, you don't want to undersell your players but we did bring in two players <sighs> Has this worked it the way we wanted it to? Did we get the replacements in and then wait for a deal that hasn't happened? Or is it a case of saying, well, hang on a minute, we've got really good options now, let's just enjoy it. And maybe when a bid does come in for Alfredo, we've got these two guys in hopefully in settled and scoring goals. I think um, what I would say firstly is I'm amazed he's still here, David. I thought it was uh, somewhat inevitable that Alfredo would move on. Um, especially at the height of when when Lille were obviously interested. I I thought it was dead set. So, you know, I've always said to folk, if you get Alfredo Fiven and you get him, you know, enjoying himself, and I think that's key to Alfredo playing well for us. I think he's got to enjoy it. And once that happens, I think we can really kick on because he is, without doubt, an amazing talent, in my opinion. If we can get that, then grand. And I think that what you're saying is right. But again, this is... This is kind of double-edged because if we win the league this year and he stays and then we sell him next summer, it'll be a master stroke. If we don't win the league and his, his value you know, depreciates and goes down, then it, it's going to, people are going to criticise it and look at it. But I think that um, the board are right and to, to um, you know, stay with where they think. If they think he's a £20 million player minimum, then great. And if he performs, then we are going to get him. But that... Um, Alfredo's role has changed a lot since last year and the last couple of years because he was the number one focal point and we used to just basically put it for him to chase and create on his own. We don't play that way anymore. Um, so there is a different role for Alfredo and it, it might be that Alfredo doesn't bang in 30 goals anymore. He might, you know, he might be 20 and they're spread out a wee bit more because the team is playing differently. He's dropping deeper a lot now to link up. And players run beyond him. You've seen it with Kent first at Pataudry. You've seen it with Arfield recently as well. So um, he, he doesn't play that same role. So he's going to be one to watch. But Alfredo, if you can get him enjoying himself, I think, you know, is an asset. Absolutely. There's no doubt, CJ, that we were too reliant on him in the past. Oh, yeah. It was basically, if he'll score goals. And if he's not there, Jermaine Defoe will hopefully score goals. Mm-hmm. Doesn't offer as much, you know, in terms of all-round play as Alfredo does. But... The rest of the team weren't really able to do that. And, and as Stevie said, we've seen it a couple of times this season. Um, obviously, Kamaru's injury uh, unfortunately curtailed it a wee bit. But we've seen it where they are interchanging more and they all um, are moving about. And that includes Alfredo. And it's it's caused more problems for teams. Does the manager have a wee bit of a striking dilemma? We saw some, <laughs> uh, some controversy, I suppose is the right word, about when the Euro squad was announced. Jermaine Defoe was uh, left out of it. Now, the word, um, certainly from the club, was that it, that was a discussion with the manager. The manager said, look, I want to use you in domestic games, spare you the travel, and especially with yeah. COVID at the moment, it's a hassle. You just stay here, keep fit, and I've got an option to turn to on a on a Saturday. I don't think he's had something like, I don't think he's ever trusted enough of his squad. And we can debate whether he was right to do that or not. I've, at times in the past, felt, look, you know, I'd rather you've got to give guys a chance or they can't do it. The the mm-hmm. argument, of course, is always that, well, I'm not watching them in training and I suppose that's fair. But he's always at this core of 13, 14 that he went to all the time. Do we finally have a position where he can say he's playing on Thursday, but then I can rest him because I trust that I've got player, players X and Y that will come in on Sunday? Uh, 100%. I think you're spot on there. I even said that in one of my last preview videos when we are going to Ross County. I was like, when I look at our front four now, obviously when they're all fully fit and healthy, 
I think if he named or if I see the start eleven come out in its its in its uh, roof, it's Morelos Defoe. Sorry, I'm sitting there. I'm saying I'm confident and happy with that, and that's the first time I can honestly say that for a very long time. And what's even better about that is it spreads right through the whole team now and I think Gerard has took it for me like you said there the 13-14 and he's actually got an 18 there that's challenging and fighting every week and could potentially play in every game and offer a lot and I think that's what you need if you want to go ahead and win titles you need a strong squad not just a, a strong starting 11. Yeah personally I don't believe you can win a league with 13-14 yeah. these days anymore I think you know you've got to have guys that that can come in and Speaking of which, um, move on to to some of the matches that we've seen this season. And one of the things was we've had guys come in in two weeks in a row that was almost a nice example of of what I I really think that we need and we haven't seen in the first two seasons under Gerard. And Stevie, that's one week Jordan Jones come in against Motherwell was excellent. OK, wasn't great the next week, but Brandon Barker came in. He contributed uh, in the match against Ross County. One of the differences I felt this season is, well, you know, these guys were the best will in the world, and this is no disrespect to them, but they probably won't play every single week, or they won't play, you know, 8 out of 10 every single week, but they haven't contributed anything in previous seasons. This year, if, if you get to the end of the season and Jordan Jones has got seven goals, say, or seven assists and played really well seven times, and Brandon Barker's played well, 10, 11, you know, when guys like that, they're maybe not playing every week or playing really well every week or absolutely nailing a first team place, but they're still contributing. I mean, that was something under Walter when we were winning leagues that there were guys in that squad that you wouldn't necessarily go, you're a total first teamer. But then you looked at the end of the season, you know, oh, I bet you got the winner that day. And I bet you did, you know, and it's all important and it all adds up. Yeah, I think that's spot on. Um, Barker and Jones are the most obvious um, kind of examples of that. Um, there's a weird thing as well that um, people have said that you know with with Brandon Barker, I, I tend to think that Brandon Barker has actually earned his contributions because he had a good preseason. He, he apparently trains really well and he, he's, he's strong. And I don't know if it, perhaps no support has helped him because sometimes I look at him and think that he doesn't really believe he should be playing for Rangers, but. Um, he's he's done really well, and, and you're spot on. You see, that's correct. We need the, the the guys from kind of 16 to 22 to to make an impact, and I think that's where um, our field's contribution has, has been so fantastic. Because many wouldn't have had Scotty as being a starter this year, but he's really stepped up when when Arabo has, has come out the team because, um, you know, he was in the starting to look in the form of his life, and we're thinking right, he's finally starting to show it. Injury's a big blow, but Scotty Arfield's come in and performed, and, and you're bang on. See if you can intertwine them two players, for example, and you get 15 um, kind of numbers and 10 assists and everything else. That's going to go a long way. And like you said, with the squad, if we can you know, rotate it slightly and use these guys, then it's going to be spot on as well. Um, but no, I mean, David, even this this might shock you. I hope you're sitting down for this, but even I'm kind of happy with how we're looking. <laughs> And uh, and you know what I'm like, and uh, I'm 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 quietly confident, and I hope we're going to talk about Hadji as well because he's has a wee of a criticism, and I think that the numbers and I, and I still think that something you said is is so spot on with him in terms of he is a moments player. Yeah. If you look at the moments he's providing, I think people get confused a wee bit with Hadji, and they maybe think that we'll, they want to see like a loud drop where he takes on four or five players and all this sort of stuff, but. If you look at the things he's done and the moments produced, I'm I'm really enjoying what we're getting out of Hadji so far and also looking at it thinking we can get more. I know that it would be more Scottish um, media for us to, one of us to, to sit down before the thing and say, right, you 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 like Hadji and I'll pretend not to and we'll have an argument. <laughs> and I know that that's the way we're supposed to do this, but maybe that's why we're not media professionals because I think the three of us rate them. <laughs> oh, yeah, are, absolutely. It's, it's, it's a rather boring thing in, in terms of, sorry, folks, I mean, you, you, if you, hey, listen, I'm sure if you turn on BT Sports, there'll be, you know, three guys that have decided beforehand what their opinion is and, and who should fight with who about what. But, no, I mean, I, I go back to my theory that Brian Loud ruined creative players for a generation of Rangers fans because up till then, we understood 
that your players like that, you might not see them for large parts of the game, but they would do something that was pivotal. But then Loudrup turned up and he's like, actually, no, I can do something every time I get near the ball. Yeah. Um, and now we expect it from everyone. And, and it's not fair. And, and CJ, you know, had you... I look at Kent, who has obviously jumped a level again a level, this season. Absolutely. And if I can bring in an example from England as well, Dominic Calvert-Lewin getting loads of, of headlines right now. Yeah, It's taken him three years. It really has. And he's grown season on season. But there has been games during that where he's been poor or you know there's been areas of his game that, that's rubbish. And I do wonder if we'd have had the patience to bring through someone like him because even Kent, you've had you know criticism over the oh, yeah. last couple of years of oh he doesn't do enough, he doesn't do enough. We can't afford to buy finished articles. We can either get guys who have passed their best on the way down or guys who are going up. Personally, I'd rather sign the guys who are going up the way because you know they'll sell on value and whatnot. But you do have to give them time to knock the kinks out the game. That's why they're here. And I think if we give Hadji that eighteen months, we'll we'll get from him what we're getting from Kent. Yeah, I think you're spot on. Even Barisic is another perfect example yeah, of that. Yeah. The first 12 months, he looked like he was gone. Like, and then we were all scratching our heads. I think even some of us were wanting Ed Flanagan to be starting the season off that season because of the way he ended it. But he stuck with him, Gerard Sosa, and gave him the confidence. And then he had that moment, obviously, versus St. Mirren in the next performance as well, which I think is very underrated. But when you're talking about oh, Hadji there, I just I look at the player and when you're bringing in a type of player of that ability, he's going to try things. Yes, he's sometimes going to mess up. He's going to try a back heel. It's not always going to connect. If it was connecting 10, 10, out of 10, uh, 10 out of 10, sorry, it'd be at Real Madrid worth it's 150 million pounds. It is going to be a patience, but like you said, he is a moments player. And you look at seven assists in his last eight games, Leeds League in assists. He's doing no too bad for someone who's apparently struggling. Well, we had guys in the past two years who could run about all day. Yeah. Yeah. And we would lose by, you know, a goal to nil. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you bring in a player of that ilk, then you've given yourself an opportunity to to win matches you would have lost. Moving on then, Stevie, to a part of the side that, look, we've had concerns about. Um, and I'm going to try and be balanced here because, see, towards the end of last season, with the defence, I was incredibly critical and frustrated because look, <laughs> they weren't shipping goals, but they were giving away stupid awful goals. I'm thinking Rugby Park towards the end of last season. I'm thinking St Johnston. And people would say to me, look, David, it's not the defence, it's a problem. It's that we've stopped scoring goals. And I'm like, yeah, but when you stop scoring goals and you're giving away goals, that's a bad combo. But uh, in a Europe where football appears to have just decided defending is something that used to happen, it feels like a sort of pre-COVID thing, Rangers have been able to, to to keep clean sheets, which seems a bit of a rarity. And I think that of the players that have maybe impressed me more this season that had been there, I want to give a wee bit of shout out for, to Connor Goldson because yeah. he doesn't get a lot of a lot of love from Rangers fans. And for me, he has been our most important defender. I'm not saying he hasn't made mistakes, Hibs springs to mind, but over the course of you know, 12, 15 matches, he has led that defence and organised it and sorted it. And I think he's a big part in Rangers maintaining this, this very decent defensive record that we've got. I've always been um, a, a Conor Goldson fanboy, if you like. I've always spoke really highly of him. And I don't give, and people have pulled me up on this before, I don't give him as much stick as, as I would somebody else, for example. But I think there's a huge reason as well that um, Goldson is, is playing so well and I think his defensive partner, and I think Philip Hillander is so underrated. Um, I think he's just an understated defender in terms of, he doesn't, you know, he, there's nothing arrogant or, or cocky or, you know, he doesn't have that attitude. He just does everything so effectively. And you look at the way he marked Falcao against Galatasaray, it was just, it was so almost robotic, like how he goes about his, his job, and I think he's key um, to to Goldson because we we know now that Goldson is is the vocal one because that's maybe something that people have noticed when there's been no support about how vocal Connor Goldson is, and he's the organizer. And I just think when he's got a steady partner next to him, um, and by that I mean that Hillander won't, you know, he won't stroll forward, he he won't 
leave his position and things like that. And I'm not saying that others do, but posi- positionally and things, he's very good. Um, and I also think as well, David, there was a couple of times in pre-season, and I don't know if people have kind of noticed or picked up on this, but we were susceptible to a, a straight ball over the top. See, since Hilanders came in um, and, and has played with goals, and we've managed to stop that happening. Yep. Now, that obviously comes from midfield as, as well as stopping that pass, but I just think positionally um, where they are together, I think that but as good a partnership as I've seen in a long time. And I do rate Katic. Um, it's not a criticism of him, but I think he's slightly more raw in terms of uh, my centre-half pairing. So I just think defensively, you know, we are looking well. But that also comes as well that, you know, the full-backs are doing well. Um, Tab's been outstanding. Oh, yeah. um, he's been, he, he really, he's stepped up again, um, which is all credit to him. Um, and, and even, you know, at times, Barisic has been good this season. And Barisic has still been good, but we've he, the others have been so good, we've actually been saying, is Barisic slightly below par? <laughs> mm. So, that, you know, as, as bad as that sounds, I think that, that shows how well we're all performing. So, you know, we have been good defensively. There, there's no criticism at all um, there. And I, I don't even know what to say, David. Normally, I have, a, I have a moan. I've got something to say. I've got something. But don't, I don't worry, I've got. Don't worry, I've got subjects. I won't leave you busting <laughs> for the end of the show. Don't <laughs> you worry. Thank you. A, this is almost too positive. Yeah, there's a couple of things here. Don't worry, I'll yeah. get you down before the end of the show, my friend. Don't you worry about that. Um, strangers, there's always something. You know, strangers, it. we've there always got something to play well, about. Sorry to interrupt there. What I really also like about uh, Connor Goldson, which I think uh, gets actually overlooked a lot, is he's usually our, our primary guy to get us up the field with his long through balls, whether it is to Kent, whether it is to Barisic to get us up, or even doing the right-hand side now, he's starting to do for Tavernier, as Tavernier's position is getting even fuller and fuller forward. And I think Goldson is one of our mainstays in the squad, not only because he's vocal and he's leader, but he's the guy that can spot a pass and go ahead and find. And I think that's been important for us to keep this pressure on teams and keep them pinned back. I also think that there is... When there's criticism of the fullbacks, it tends to be, and I'm guilty of this, a generational thing. Because if you're my age, the the phrase that, that you hear a lot, and I've I've used this, I've said it myself, um, is I like my fullbacks to be able to defend first and then attack <laughs> secondly, because that's how I grew up. That's yeah. that's what you know. And we were lucky at Rangers because we had Gary Stevens, who was probably the first modern fullback I remember in terms of Christ, he can get up and down that wing, but it wasn't that common. Um, whereas I'm never going to be satisfied. I've kind of come to realise with with a fullback because of that. Because even somebody like Trent Alexander Arnold, who I think is one of the best in the world right now, I will go. Ah, you can get at him defensively. And it's really when you listen to managers, CJ, they will tell people like me, yeah, but I don't care. Um, <laughs> I un- no, I understand. That's not why he's in the team primarily. Yeah. And it's almost like a fundamental disagreement, really, on what a fullback does. So I think if you're kind of like one of us older bears, you might go, I but defensively. Whereas I think in the modern game for managers, it's like, no, I get that. You know, I don't want a, a kind of converted centre back in there that can defend and, and you know, great position. I want somebody that will go forward. And I accept that so long as it's not every week, every so often we might pay a price for that. But look what we'll get at the other end instead. Yeah, I think you're spot on there. I think actually Gerard's kind of almost met you halfway with that because he's keeping Tavernier going forward, but he's also using Jacko. He's using one of the holding midfielders to actually slot in there and fill in at the, the right back spot. That's why sometimes we get a wee bit frustrated with our two sitting midfielders. But their job is that to try and cover that because you look at even last season when we were piling pressure on, we were susceptible to a counter attack. But I feel like the two midfielders are sort of sacrificing going forward to allow the fullbacks to go forward. So I think he's tried to adjust it and try and add a wee bit more steel defensively, but you've got to kind of play to the player's strengths. And Barisic's and Tav's strengths definitely going forward and whipping balls in. I mean, Tavani has just been at a different level to almost everyone right now. Um, just going forward, he's involved in everything. And you could argue with the way Hadji likes to cut inside or whoever's starting at that position, he is the right-hand side, whether it is going forward and defensively. And that's impressive for an entire 90 minutes. Yes. See something you just sorry, David. See something you just said there, CJ. Mm-hmm. In terms of like the the two defensive midfielders yeah. um, being able. Well, to that come. that is a bone of contention. I was going to ask you. Know, <laughs> you know that is something you hear a lot, Jackarama, etc. That mm. is that uh, an issue 
for us uh, in certain well, yeah. or is it just an essential price you've got to pay if you well, want to play this system? What what I was going to say is, see when you've got Kent and you've got Haji and you've got Roof mm-hmm. in that three, or you've got Barker or Jones or whatever coming on, see your two defensive midfielders, they, they might not be two defensive midfielders now with, with Zungu coming in, yeah. in, incidentally. But what I was going to say is, my, my opinion on that is that they can be sacrificed more to sit deeper and, and Davis can can be that kind of playmaker in that now because of the options we now have. Which Spot on. To, to kind of CJ's point, saying that we did have, you know, we were over-reliant on, on people, but now there is more. We, you know, and that's why, it's even people talk about kind of Hadji as being a moments player and things like that and say that's maybe not good enough. I totally disagree because yep. if you're getting, you know, Kane and you've got Roof and you've got Hadji, and you only get one moment from Hadji, but that one moment from Hadji is that ball over the top of the through ball that creates a goal. That is good enough, because yeah. the other ones will pitch in as well, and I think that's where we we do have um, kind of different, and, and I know that people are still um, wounded and kind of, I, I'm a wee bit like, well, this team need to prove it, and they do, but we do have more um, in our kind of armoury this year in terms of last year it was a bit like, well, we've got Kent and we've got Alfredo and we're okay, but now we've got so many options. And I'm just hopeful that um, Roof gets a run because his his movement adds so much up there as well. I think that he's going to be an incredible player for us. Um, so, no, I mean, I, I think there's been a combination of a couple of wee things that have fallen into place for us. And in terms of the defensive midfielders, I think they can. There isn't much pressure for them to kind of get involved now. It's only when we kind of go away to, to Hibs or, or maybe at Ross County when they do have such a barrier that, um, you know, we do miss players from injury and things like that. So hopefully they can come back. But if you if you consider that we're missing, that, that you know, we're missing Arabo, we're missing Roof, these guys are, are, are huge players. When we've got a full contingent, I think the options we'll have are incredible. It's almost like an evolution of the squad. You see it for the first year to the second year to the third year. It feels like Gerard's been building to almost where we're at now, where he can have the attacking wingers. He's also got the people who defend it, and we've got the attacking quality to open the low block doors, as I like to say on the channel. And it just feels like it's an evolution, and it's almost like a long-term plan that we're now starting to see the benefit of that we were sometimes questioning last year and the year before. What a lovely word that is. That is perfect, David. The evolution of the squad and the team. That's spot on because it was maybe one, two options. Now I feel like we've got so many more. I love that. I'm going to use that. Cheers, mate. <laughs> we, didn't, we, we didn't just bring him in for his hair. I mean, although <laughs> we're, we're covetous of of that. Um, but, you know, the, the, there's insight there as well. Look, a guy we've mentioned a lot on this pod without specifically talking about <clears throat> is Ryan Kent. Yeah. And I think one of the reasons for that is that He's just been so consistent. There's been a reliability. It's like, ah, well, you know, you're going to get this out of Ryan Kent. And he has, if you like, almost pushed through that, well, moment. And he's pushed through that into, I felt this season, CJ grabbing the mantle and saying, you know what, I'm the man and give me it, I want it. And even even if he is getting the ball taken off him, he never hides. He just gets back up and give me it again. And a player like that, I think, has been so important because Rangers have missed what I would term a swagger. Yeah. Um, over the last few seasons and Kent is, is delivering that and I think a player like that apart from his undoubted talent is important for the rest of the squad because in a game where the going gets tough if you've got a guy like that then the rest of the team go Let, if I do my job he'll do something and it gives them that extra 5-10% Oh, I, I, you're absolutely spot on. I, I absolutely just love watching Ryan Kent play football. He seems to have it at his feet, but also in his head as well. He just understands the mentality. And you could say he's a flair player or that, but is he really? Because he gets kicked for pillar to post. He never hides. He's tracking back and defending every time. And one of the things that I absolutely always think about this season, I think it perfectly summarises Ryan Kent. Yes, it did end up in a goal, but if you think of that game versus Livingston, where we weren't playing well, it was probably our worst performance of the season. Late on the game, 90th minute or just the 89th, he runs and gets it in his own half, beats three or four people and actually drags us upfield, cuts inside and just hits it just wide. But the fact that he had that still and, and he's got to go and get the ball and try and make something happen right at the depth before uh, death, sorry, before the final whistle just shows that he wants to be the guy and he's accepted being the guy at Rangers. And I think, like you said, they would have needed that 
for a long time. Doesn't matter if they're going to kick him or step on his heel or nudge him or anything like that. He's willing to take all that because he's willing to go anywhere on the park to make it tick. You've he got makes such... me sorry, David. On, David. He makes no, me sit at the edge. Yeah, that for me is exciting. He's a cracking player. I love watching him. And again, you know, it's it's a wee bit of time and look what we're going to get out of him. And again, it's the, the whole thing. Yeah, he was seven million. If Rangers went to sell him in the next oh. window, which they wouldn't, thankfully, yeah. but if they did, um, you'd be like the three times at minimum, you yeah. know, minimum. And and that's the type of investment that a club like ours needs. Right, you've got 30 seconds each. You might not need it, but you've got 30 seconds each on this one. Who is the number one, Stevie? Oh, McGregor. Oh, unequivocal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as, uh, I'm sorry, as impressive as John McLaughlin is, I think the the work he's done and he's still doing McGregor for me. There's a difference between a good goalkeeper and a great goalkeeper. Perfect. And there, yeah. there were, the, the night in Holland was for me the difference. It wasn't that John McLaughlin would have done badly, but he'd have conceded one yeah. that night because Alan McGregor makes the saves that make you go holy how did he get to that? Uh, and that's not a criticism of John McGuire. In terms of a backup, my goodness, fantastic. Uh, I'm not going to panic at all if, for whatever reason, Alan McGregor can't make the game. But yeah, that that's the difference. That's your number one. It, it's Alan McGregor and Neil Alexander all over again for me. It's yeah. not that there's anything wrong with a guy sitting ready to come in, but it's just, yeah, you know you know, class when you see it. And, and there is there. Okay, Stevie, I, uh, I did promise you um, that I... <laughs> There would be an opportunity. It's been a good season. We're all happy about how we're shaping up on the pitch. Still get that nervousness uh, that will be there up until we we win something. It's that simple. We can debate about uh, symptoms of that, but it all comes down to the same thing, which is we're desperate for something silver waved at us. So that will always be an issue and a bone of contention. But one thing that I think was a legitimate bone of contention um, under Angel support was the Castor kit deal. Not for the deal, which has been very good for Rangers. And say that right at the start of this, that if you are Rangers FC, this has been a brilliant deal for you. It enabled you to get away from sports. Uh, Castor offered things that nobody else would, which was why they were chosen. And it helped Rangers escape the clutches of Sports Direct. They've already paid in millions of pounds to Rangers. They will pay in millions of pounds because the sales have been incredible. All good. However, we are not accountants on this show. We are fans and we buy a lot of kit, and certainly in my case. And yes, I do buy it before anybody gets <laughs> smart about it. Um, and I don't know... Many bears who've bought multiple things who haven't had at least one issue. Um, I'm exactly the same. I I bought certain things where I'm like, are you kidding me? Uh, the the rollout was a shambles. I mean, there's there's no argue. Well, maybe one of you want to argue that. I don't I don't think so. But the the rollout was a shambles, despite warnings. And I think the three of us in this show can can say confidently they were warned because we warned them. Um, I I know that I have heard these two people discussing it with them, so I know that we warned them. But while it's stabilised, I think it's fair to say, and they're probably through the worst of it, the most generous thing I can say is, Stevie, it cannot happen again. No, I think this is where um, they have to learn and we'll obviously see a lot next season. And we'll also see a lot, David, in the, in the upcoming months. If you remember, they did promise us that around about Christmas time, the second wave of, of merchandise would come in. So that's more your traditional tat, if you like. So what in Rubber there? ducks. Aye. Yes. Yeah. And, and I know that's silly and I know we laugh about it, but... There is such I'm a, fucking uh, desperate for one. I'm <laughs> totally made to have anyone. See, if you put a Rangers badge on anything, people will want it. So, and I remember I I told Tom this like quite specifically, and it's it's there as a, a matter of public record that you know if you if you put a, a Rangers badge on a bin or a rug or a duck or whatever, we will sell it out. So this is where they 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 promised, you know that that kind of side of it and. The whole thing with with Castor, I think, was a bit frustrating, and and I think that um, we all wanted it to be so good, 
and obviously they they've had to to kind of how does it not act as salesmen, but they have the the spoke about their brand has been the very best and everything else. So we quite rightly expected it to be you know faultless and things like that. But I think the level of, of mistake has been too high, um, and and that's been problematic. And it just seems to have been one issue after the other. But like you said, David, I don't want to be too negative on it because see if it doesn't happen ever again, then we'll want to watch with this deal. Because it is so good with the club. They have put in a lot of money. We will make a lot of money off this. And if you're looking at us making five, six million pounds a year that we never had, that is essentially paying for your roofs and your ittins and things like that. So it's it it can be potentially brilliant for the club, but it does need to be better. And I think everything's aware, everybody's aware of that. But the only aside of Castor, I, I just think that I have been disappointed. And and I don't want to go over the top and I don't want to be critical, but I have been disappointed slightly in, in the club in terms of when things were happening. Um, I wanted a wee bit more vocal leadership from them and I don't even know, do you know what, I'm, I'm kind of fickle David in, in terms of saying that because people have said to me, right, well what, what would you want from the club and I think that that's a difficult one because I don't expect the club to come out and slate Castor or whatever but I would have felt better if, if James Bisgrove or somebody had been front and centre and said look we are aware of, of the issues, we are working really hard with Castor to ensure that it doesn't happen again and, and we are rolling out you know, contingencies for the future that would have been enough to kind of settle me and I think settle a lot of the fans. And I think that when you create a vacuum, and that's something you've said before, and again, I'm stealing it because, as we as we know, I don't have my own path. But <laughs> when you create a vacuum, people will fill it. And I think that a lot of a lot of the summer, when there wasn't much being said by the club, I think that's what happened. I think in that instance, what well, I think the club would have liked to is, is, is what what my understanding is is that the club would have liked to have been more direct but there was a third party involved and they had to respect the wishes that they had and I think that Castor were we joke about this but it's true nobody knows the size of Rangers till they experience it and they can talk about it they can say yeah yeah and I'm sure they think they do but if you ever want a case study for a new partner coming into the Rangers and say you don't you don't know what's about to hit you, then it's this. And I think that's what happened. And I, I think there were um, things on a human level that when everybody, when it does finally settle down, everybody turns around and just looks back over, that people will say, I could have done this better. I should have done that. I could have done this. Um, the problem that they had, CG, was firstly, they were so enthusiastic that everybody, uh, I think, really got swept along with it. Secondly, I also think that there's been a bit of a perfect storm this yeah. year, you know, with COVID, with uh, not not only the problems that that would cause with manufacturing, but with the, the the kind of mood of people. And thirdly, and this was a big thing, we are scarred in terms of kits. We are a, a support because we've had 10 years of this pish. And that meant that they weren't coming in with a clean slate. And I think it, it's maybe human nature to go, well, you know, it, it's our first mistake, and we are going. No, it's your first mistake, yeah, but it's our before. yeah, <laughs> it's our four hundred and twentieth. So I think that all of that was was very much a part of it. However, uh, as Stevie says, you can only really say. I mean, it's done now, right? I mean, that, that, that we can't get the time back. We can't unmistake some mistakes. We can't change things that have happened. It's now about what the future is going to bring because this deal has to work for Rangers. It, it's vital. Yeah, it is, and it's vital, like uh, Stevie was saying, to be able to bring in these types of players, and the deal that we've got is much better than any deal we've had for a very, very long time. The the launch was very, very rough, let's put it that way, but I'm just hoping like the landing and then going forward is always going to be a little more smoother, because they can always look back and say, it surely can't have been worse than that. You know what I mean? Maybe that's me being an optimist, but I think like they'll grow as that, because this is the first venture into football and that as well, so I've just got my fingers crossed, I'm just saying, right, They've heard that now, let's build forward now and just try and go forward because, like you said, everything, almost like the world was gone wrong at the same time. And that just <laughs> summarises that when we finally get a good deal on the table, just it seems to be another issue. And we have been scarred many, many times, but it is their first venture in, it is their mistake. Now, let's see, judge them on next season if it's a better launch. If it's the exact same problems, then we'll obviously have a lot more questions to ask. But I'm just going to try and be optimistic and say, right, they've got the mistakes out of the way now, it's, it's time to go. Stevie, I wanted to to discuss this um, 
it's almost a little bit kind of continuation of something that we talked about uh, in the Cousteau thing there, which is that the world, of course, has seen that people are going through exceptionally difficult times. And I think in certain places it's manifested in uh, some of the the debate and, and uh, banter and online interaction among supporters. Uh, after the Livingston game, which was a draw, you know, and not a great result, but it wasn't the end of the world. We were undefeated at that point. We hadn't conceded a goal. The reaction was as savage as I can remember to uh, a, a non-victory in a long time. And we've had some bad results the last few years. But the reaction was was really, really bad. And it was noted, I think, not just by... You know, people like us, but but that, that you know, obviously do have a, spend a lot of time on social media. But I, I know speaking to other you know Rangers fans, maybe more traditional Rangers fans, that they were saying, "Christ, yeah, everybody lost their shit." Is that just you know us as Rangers fans, or is it maybe we all need to go? Do you know what? People are going to be a bit testy at the moment. People are going to be a bit um, you, you know sensitive. The blood's going to be up because. Just, just look what's happening around us. Yes and no. I, I just, see with that whole Livingston game. I think that what worried me and what angered me is that I've seen this before, and whether that's fair or unfair. I mean, I remember like big Alex Schrader saying to me at the time. He said that I, I thought he thought that my opinion on it was was very kind of rigid and, and unfair. My problem is that it's just that. It goes back to a word you used before. I am desperate, desperate, desperate for us to be back where we belong. And and yeah, maybe maybe we did all lose our shit a wee bit after that game. But I, I'm just terrified of of allowing myself to be excited about what we're doing at the moment because it almost seems like it's inevitable it might break down again. And until they can prove me wrong, that's where I am with it. So yeah, I mean, we we did probably to that and it is maybe symptomatic of a lot of things that are going on but it's just it's such a difficult one it goes back you know we talk about Castor and, and being scarred and things like that then I think as a support we are kind of scarred but that's a fine line I mean all it would have taken was you know one inch a shot either way and we would have won yeah. that cup and I think that if we had done that a lot of where we are now and how we're feeling wouldn't be feeling because we would have a better belief in the squad and Maybe they would have kicked on and things like that as well. So, yeah, David, look, <sighs> difficult one as well to, to to say. I think I'm probably one of the, the worst at times for, for, for kind of overreacting. Sometimes you can blog something and it's there as public record and you can never kind of say it back or it, it looks really harsh and, and things like that. You know, it's different maybe in, in terms of a way to a podcast where, you know, you can justify yourself a wee bit better, but... The Livingston game, to me, was it gave me a bit of a fright in terms of, well, we haven't learned our lessons, or not that we haven't learned our lessons, if we continue to do this three or four times in the year, we're not going to win. So, I don't know. Did, did I flap a wee bit, David? I don't know. Probably. <laughs> I think that, again, I maybe, well, the reason I think maybe, CJ, that it was... Uh, a timing thing is that we drew with Hibs and we were all really disappointed, but it wasn't the same. No, it didn't yeah. it didn't feel anywhere near the same level. And maybe it's because it's Hibs and you know they're a better team, and then we'd expect them to be uh, top six and Levy. Although I, I think a bloody top place to go for us or um, I hate it, yeah, yeah. Oh god, yeah. Well, I, I, I can't go to see Rangers at Livingston because I'm a jinx. Um, I've never, <laughs> I know I've been there like half a dozen times. I've never seen his win, so. That, that tells you something about it, but um, I, I I think that it was almost as Stevie said that sort of same old same old, and the the sort of panic kicked in a little bit. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. When I was putting my video up, I remember like the first couple of comments that came in. People were like joking and saying, "CJ, you shouldn't even have recorded a new video. You could have picked any of the times we dropped points last season." Said yeah. it. It was too passive. It was side to side. We wasted more time in the middle of the park. I think that's why people were frustrated. Like the Hibs game was what it was. You know what I mean? We made a mistake. We got caught in a brain the offside. Blah blah blah. But again, we still missed our chances in that game. But 
we were still creating in that game. It was the fact that in the Livingston match where there was just so many reminiscent stuff that we were doing, it was just like, oh, no, no. The subs were a wee bit too late. We didn't really do enough. That's why I think everyone was really going at it. Like you said, we were beating people for fun up to that point as well. So we started enjoying ourselves. And mm. then we go to a tough place, which is always tough, and you're never, ever going to get an easy game here on that plastic part. But it just felt... Oh no, here we go. We've seen this story before. But um, I said in my video, and I got a wee bit of flack for it, but I was like, hopefully we can use that as a wee kick up the arse to go and put a wee run together again. And that's kind of what we did. And I said that after the Hibs game <laughs> as well. I'm like, we're never going to win every single game 2 or 3 now. There is going to be the occasional bumps, but it's how we respond and if we can go on another run again, because that's what we struggled at the previous seasons where we would have that mistake, we would drop points, but we wouldn't come back out and put another run together. It'd be sitting it'd be the draw again or a win then a draw or a win then a loss so I've been impressed with how we've been able just to roll our sleeves up get back to winning and putting another win and run together and I think that shows a wee bit of improvement or at least that's how I'm trying to be optimistic about it <laughs> I think a part of it is in the old days after a bad result you went to the pub you moaned like hell with your pals or you went into school or work or whatever and you moaned like hell with your pals and that was it and you got on with the next one but these yeah. days you put it up on social media and it's yeah. there forever first of all and then People start arguing with you back, and and, yeah. and it doesn't. You don't just vent the the way you used to. It goes on for three or four days. Yeah, and you know people double down on a position that they maybe took in anger five minutes after the game, and they maybe don't quite feel the same way three days later. But they because they've said this, they feel mm. that they need to, and and I think it can can turn into a kind of spiral of negativity, and it, it's something that I get, and I, I know both of you guys will get as well. As sometimes people will say, well, you know, you weren't critical enough, and you're like, well. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's 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 easy to, to to chuck everything out and just ah we're all doomed straight away. But it's, personally, I am an optimist. You know, I, I tend to go okay, right? Let's move on to the next one. And um, but I can understand that. Look, we can talk about this. Stevie nailed it. It ain't going to change until we're winning one, things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, and it's not. It, it, we can debate about whether it's right, wrong, indifferent, helpful, any of those words you want to use. It is not going to change until we win something, so the team will just have to, to get used to that. Mm-hmm. Europe has been uh, another um, fantastic season for us in, in European football. Even if we were to lose the six matches in the group stage, which I don't think we will, but even if we were, we got the money, and that's that's what matters. Um, eleven qualifying ties, eleven qualifying victories. This is you know remarkable stuff. We all have criticism of the domestic side, and as we've mentioned, there that won't change until until we're winning things. But in terms of of Europe and the financial impact of that, and also something I think that gets underplayed a wee bit, the status. Because Rangers should be a European force. Yeah, and do you know what? Do you know what's incredible about it, David, in, in terms of where we were and, and, and where we are and, and things like that is we got Galatasaray at home and my first reaction was, well, yeah, we'll beat them. Yeah, mine too. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that, you know, every supporter kind of thinks that... Um, I remember John Brown famously saying that um, if we played Barcelona tomorrow, we would expect a draw minimum. <laughs> and, and you know we all kind of go on about about that, and no matter where your club is, but in terms of where we are now, we're just we're so well oiled, we're so well organised, we're so well fine tuned in terms of everybody knows their jobs. And even like we went to Holland and we battered Willem to a four nil, and I don't even think that gets enough credit. We were incredible that night, yeah. and that is an amazing result to go over to Holland against mm, any agreed. and bang in four goals, and we kind of just. We kind of just went, all right, okay, well, on to the weekend. And it was like, <laughs> you know, we did, though. And it we was, did, eh? It was such an amazing result. And I don't think and I don't think we give ourselves enough credit for the achievements we have done in Europe. Um, and, and Galatasaray, even, we are sitting at half-time with Galatasaray, nil-nil. They had created very, very little were saying to you, I text you and said, I think we're giving them slightly too much respect. Agreed. At half-time, I was a wee bit worried. <laughs> But that, again, is a wee bit more of a, a kind of symptom of, of where we are in, in terms of how we can perform on that stage. Because we weren't saying, well, well, you know, it's nil-nil, good, we're doing all right. We were saying, well, it's nil-nil, we could do better. Mm-hmm. I think that's such a, a kind of positive thing to, to take from it in terms of there isn't too many teams now, 
apart from your really your elite your likes of your your Leverkusen, who I think are like the elite tier, and I think there's maybe a dozen sixteen teams in Europe where you wouldn't fancy playing them. But see anybody else, David, I'd be quite happy for Rangers to go up against them. And I just feel that that, that is a, a huge pat in the back in terms of the management team, Mick Beale, Tom Kilshaw and things, the way they organised them. Um, and of course, obviously the manager, not taking it away from him. But I just think that, that where we are is really healthy and it's really exciting. You know, that group got made and we were like Benfica, um, you know, Leg Poznan and stuff like that. And we all kind of just on unison said, well, yeah, we can do uh, it. We'll, yeah. we'll get through that. Oh, yeah. definitely. Well, you know, bring it on and all credit to them. The, the, the money they've brought in has been, again, a, a huge positive because that does allow us to, to kind of build and, and bring these other players in and, and keep going and keep forgetting. And like CJ said, see, I told you I would, would steal it. This is all part of the evolution of, of where Gerard was when he started to where we are now. We're now a team that people don't want to draw in Europe and we are a team where we, we can be confident that we're going to do well and not embarrass ourselves. I don't think we're going to embarrass ourselves in any of the games and I think we'll put in a, a decent show in all of them. So bring it on. I'm excited. I think we can do well. Yeah, I think that this is probably when I grew up um, in the 90s. Rangers in Europe, you couldn't trust them. That simple. They, they, they were, we had the great run, 92, 93, recovered a bit under Advocate, but there were so many times when Rangers let ourselves down and didn't deliver, that it, it's almost, to me, still a bit of a novelty, CJ, that that when we go to Holland and smash them for, and expect to win, and mm. win, um, I'm kind of like, wow, still, and that's scarring. As a younger bear, though, are, are you just kind of, yeah, this is part, or is it, no, actually, we do deserve a bit of credit for this? No, no I think, <laughs> well, I think we do deserve a wee bit of credit because I look at it, um, especially with the, the tough times and all that we heard, like the times we had and your name was dragged through the mud and this and this and this. But now what Gerald's done with this team is it's got respect back to Rangers and we're starting to put ourselves in the European stage and we're playing against teams. I mean, I think it was the, the Willem coach that said we were a Champions League level side. That's what he said after the match. And I just like the fact now that we're going out there we're saying we're, we're kind of rubbing the mud that was put on our name and everything like that, whatever it was said, and we're just getting the respect back to the club. And I'm sure that's gone a long way, being able to bring in top I players and all that as well. Yeah, because people are now looking and saying, "Wow, that that's tremendous! Look what they're going to go ahead and do there." I want to go and be a part of this team that continues to show at a European level that they belong. Right, gentlemen, um, we've had a lot of fun, but uh, conscious of time, I don't want to keep you here all day. <laughs> we will be back here in one month. And to end up then, lads, very simple question. In one month's time, Stevie, where do you expect us to be? Top of the league and four points in Europe. <laughs> He's going for it. There's <laughs> no messing about there from Stevie. Like, just win every game from now till then, please, Rangers. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think an unfair expectation, CJ. Well, I'm going top of the league and top of the Europa League. I'm going for Beth. <laughs> there you go. That would, that, that would do me as well. Um, yeah, look, I think, you know, league is bread and butter. And for me, we've got these opportunities. People might say, well, you're not really talking much about the game at the weekend, if it happens course uh i think we all have our suspicions but it's because this show is more of a a roundup and a look at themes and and what's been happening as opposed to very much specifics but it's a big game it always is um and i think we're in a position to really put down a marker and then build on it over the next few weeks so i'd be extremely disappointed if we were here in a month and we were all ranting and raving but it could happen because it's Rangers, um, and you ne- you never know. You never know. It, it, it's an absolute roller coaster. But I think we're progressing in the right direction, as you both have said. You you know there will be times this season, undoubtedly, that we'll get a, a kick in the nuts. Um, but I I have a bit of faith in them that they can recover and make sure that there are, if you like, few enough kicks downstairs that we can succeed and that we can do something this season and let's face it you know that that we, we have to we need we need silverware it's that simple and that's it ladies and gentlemen boys and girls that is the end of this month's rangers review hopefully you did enjoy it enough and hell if you're still watching right now by the way comment brian loud drop down in the comments just to see who the absolute legends are who watch right 
to the very, very end. But before we actually wrap up today's video, I just want to say a massive thank you to Stevie from Four Lads Had a Dream. Again, all his information will be down there in the description below and David from Heart and Hand as well. The links for that will also be down there in the description below. But all that's left is for me and thee today is thank you so much for watching or listening to today's video. I will see you tomorrow as the build-up to the old firm begins. People, I'll see you then. Take care of yourselves and bye-bye.